I never know what markets are going to do. Uh, there's never been a time in my life when I, I... I know what markets are going to do over a long period of time. They're going to go up. But uh, in terms of what's going to happen in a day or a week or a month or a year even, uh, I, I, I never felt that I knew it and I've never felt it was important. I, I, I will say that in 10 or 20 or 30 years, I think stocks will be a lot higher than they are now. Let me save you a lot of trouble today as you hear all different opinions about the stock market, different analysts and people pontificating about the future of the economy, the recession coming up, the single dip or the double dip that's going to happen, interest rates, inflation, the next earnings season, and on and on. Warren Buffett simplifies this for us. We don't know what direction the market's going to go tomorrow or the next day, but over a 10-year period, there is a very good chance that it's going to go up. Over a 20-year period, it's almost unquestionable that stocks are going to go up. It's happened in literally every rolling 20-year period since the beginning of the stock market. So the reason that I'm not worried about my portfolio or the fact that the market's in the red today, oh no, I'm down $8,000 today, so much money vanished. The reason that I'm not concerned about this is because I look at the fundamentals of the companies that I'm invested in. I look on an individual case-by-case -case basis and I don't let the market whipsawing back and forth from positive to negative on a weekly or monthly basis, change my long-term perspective about how my investments are doing. Now, having said that, we do have a lot to get into in this episode. The first thing that I want to get into is related to all the talk about the market. I think one thing that every investor should do if you're investing in individual companies is create a chart just like this. It literally takes 10 minutes to do, and you can record how your companies are doing on an earnings basis you can see if they're beating their expectations or missing. I did that for every single holding in every one of my companies, and I also compared it against the average of the market. The S&P 500 in Q2 had an average of 62% beat earnings. My portfolio and the capital that I invested has 77% beat earnings. So we're overall doing really well, and there's more insights that we can gain from this. So in this episode, I'll be going over the Q2 earnings, this chart, and what I plan on doing in the future related to this. Now, we also have some big news. MoviePass is back. Remember MoviePass with their business model of letting you watch unlimited movies for $10 per month? You could literally watch a movie a day. It was almost too good to be true. Well, it actually was. The company ended up going bankrupt, but now they're back, and they have a bigger and better plan than before, and it's going to be premiering in two days and 19 hours and eight minutes. So we're going to discuss what went wrong with MoviePass, the original business model, and what they're trying to do to update the business model to make it a success this time around. Now, speaking of movies and television, we also have the premiere of House of Dragon, the prequel to Game of Thrones that premiered last night. And it actually was such a success that it caused problems. There's people that had trouble streaming it. We're going to go over this and how it's affected Warner Brothers Discovery and see if this can change anything for this new streaming service. And then finally, we have more TikTok advice. The last one that we went over was how to have a productive day, which included checking yourself in the mirror at least five times a day. This one is more simple. This is how to become completely financially set within 10 years by following three simple steps. So as always, we have a lot to jump into in this episode. If you like this type of content, make sure you subscribe to the channel with the bell icon so you get notifications. That bell icon is the way that YouTube notifies you with a toast notification. Now, let's go ahead and just do a quick portfolio update. I haven't made any major changes. What I've been doing is continually dollar cost averaging into the market come rain or shine. No matter what direction the market's going, whether it's going up or whether it's going down, like days like today, it's down around 2%. I've just been buying into companies that I think are currently good value. One of them is Church and Dwight. I've been building up a little bit bigger position in this company. I bought more Nike and I bought a little bit more Pepsi. I'm currently buying these consumer staple and consumer companies. I bought a bit more of the restaurant stocks. I know these ones are supposed to be bad buys right now because apparently we're going into a big recession, but I can't help myself. I like the business models of them. I wanna hold them for a multi-year period. So whether or not we go into a recession is not a huge problem for me. I plan on holding them right through it. Now, this is the view of the dip finder. This is a tool available to all Patreon members that shows all of my companies on the passive income account and whether or not they're really doing well, trading upwards, or whether or not they're selling off right now. The left hand of these, the companies like Target, T. Rowe Price, Nike, and JP Morgan 
are way below their 200 day moving average, meaning these ones are still in a technical dip. They're trading downwards. The ones on the right side here, Vici, Canadian Pacific, Texas Roadhouse, and Apple, they're all trading upwards. Vici doing the best by far. So we have a bit of a split here. It's no longer every single company in my portfolios in a dip. Now it's split around 50%. So I'm trying to put more emphasis into buying the ones that are currently in a big dip. Nike's in a dip and Church and & Dwight is in a dip and I've been buying those two companies. I have not been buying any more Vici or Canadian Pacific. They've just had too much momentum carrying them up and I wanna wait until they get to a lower price. Now, like you've seen before, I've been tracking this Q2 earnings season and how my companies do, and I've been comparing it to the benchmark of the S&P 500. What I tracked here is the revenue, the earnings per share, and the forecast they gave. And overall, I've been very satisfied with the results. I have every single company, top to bottom, my most heavy-weighted company to lowest-weighted, and then I added that up, whether or not they beat their earnings per share projection, then I compared that against the average of the S&P 500. Right now, around 77% of my invested capital has beat their earnings per share projection, and that's compared to around 62% of the S&P 500. Anytime we're doing above average, I think that's a good thing. And the companies that I'm invested in are very strong companies. I wanna invest in companies that continually beat their expectation and grow their earnings year over year. Now, one of the problems with my portfolio that really dragged down the overall result was Microsoft. I'm heavily overweighted in Microsoft with a 13.4% weighting and they missed. They missed both their revenue and their earnings per share. This is incredibly rare and I don't expect Microsoft to have a repeat in the near future. To give you an idea of how rare this is, this is a historical look at their earnings per share surprise. The last time that Microsoft missed their earnings per share like they just did was back in 2014. That was literally the last time they've missed their earnings. So I think that Microsoft more than likely won't have another repeat of this. I think they'll continually beat their earnings per share. And I've decided I'll do the exact same thing for Q3 as well. I'll look at all of my companies, I'll keep track of which ones miss and beat, and how it compares against the S&P 500. And I'll keep a history of this as well. I won't delete this, so I'll see how my companies do over time, tracking them quarter by quarter. I think it's very interesting to look at. Now moving on from my portfolio, I have to talk about MoviePass because they're making a comeback. They even have this hype building countdown ticker where they say they have two days and 18 hours until the MoviePass beta app is accessible by invite only. Very prestigious. You gotta have invite only to get part of this. And it makes sense. The last MoviePass app was such a good value that basically nothing else competed against it. And just to go over the business model of MoviePass, what it was historically at least, I think there's nobody that explains it better than Gus Johnson. Gus Johnson is a YouTuber. I'll leave the video link in the description below. Here's a video he did a couple years ago that I really think accurately portrays the MoviePass business model. Hi, I'm Jonathan Movie, founder and CEO of MoviePass, a humble little app where you can pay $20 a month and watch as many movies as you want. So go download our little app and get out there. Just go have, go have fun with it, man. Go nuts with it. Uh, hey guys, Jonathan Movie checking in again. Um, <clears throat> uh, turns out a lot of people signed up for Movie Pass, like a like a whole bunch of people signed up for Movie Pass, uh, which is fine, which is good. That's really good. We, that's what we want to see. But uh, maybe just uh, between you and me, maybe if you guys could stop telling your friends and family about Movie Pass, that'd be really helpful. Um, again, no need to panic. Everything's fine. Uh, you can. Still keep seeing some movies. Maybe don't go see every movie. You don't have to see every movie every day, okay? Um, but just maybe cool your jets a little bit. That'd be really great uh, if you could stop seeing so many goddamn so many movies. Um, so thank you, guys. Um, just keep keep it up. Uh, control it though. He's acting, but his portrayal of this is correct. Movie Pass started as a small app, and it was this thing that you could pay twenty dollars a month and see unlimited amount of movies. Literally any movie you wanted any time of the day. And while it did start off as a small experiment, this MoviePass app grew very quickly. Within two days, subscriptions went from 20,000 to 100,000. That was in two days. In less than a year, MoviePass had over 3 million subscribers. And remember that at this time, they had no profitable business model. Every single subscriber cost the company money. You could sign up for MoviePass for $20 a month and see $100 worth of movies, taking money directly from the investors. And this continued on. Uh, hey guys, uh, Jonathan Movie checking in. Uh, frankly, kind of pissed. Uh, I told you guys to chill last time, maybe stop telling friends and family. 
Turns out people just keep signing up for the service like movies grow on trees. Uh, and maybe just stop signing up for the app, okay? Stop it. Go get a DVD or something. Just maybe stop. Just maybe just stop. Could you do that? Could you do that for two seconds? You're gonna see every movie every night, okay? Jonathan Movie, checking in. Long story short, MoviePass grew too fast too big with no way to monetize their subscribers and with them being a money losing company, they blew through hundreds of millions of dollars in a matter of months. The company was eventually sued and filed for bankruptcy and Mark Wahlberg's nonfiction production company's making a documentary on this story. But that leaves us to where we're at now. Movie Pass is back and it's gonna be opening in beta, invite only in two days. Now it seems like they've learned their lesson. This time they say the prices are going to vary between 10, 20, or $30 a month. Each subscription option will give the user a number of credits to use each month to see the movies. There won't be an unlimited option during the beta version. They've learned their lesson with that unlimited option. If you give someone the ability to see any movie anytime for free, most people are going to go and see every single movie that comes out. There's literally no downside. If you have the time, you could go to any movie you want. So they completely took away that option. They also changed the color of the debit card for whatever that's worth. It's a MasterCard that's all black that has a new MoviePass logo. So you can flash that when you go to the movies. Now overall, this is another thing being created that probably doesn't need to exist. Because the major movie chains, virtually all of them, have already caught on to the whole subscription idea. We have AMC theaters having their A-list, see up to three movies every week. Cinemark did the same thing, they call it the Cinemark Movie Club. You subscribe, you pay a little bit every month, you get one free ticket, 20% off of snacks, you can avoid all the online fees when you reserve a movie ahead of time. It has all the basic perks rolled into their memory. Membership. So while MoviePass is making a comeback, unfortunately, I think there's slim chance that it will ever be as big or notable as the first iteration. Now we also have some big news that the House of Dragon premiere was so popular with millions of viewers that it actually crashed a lot of the app. It had technical difficulties because of how big this premiere was. Now, before we jump into that story, I have to do a quick shout out for today's sponsor of this video. It's FTX US. And they are known as a cryptocurrency exchange. I don't really do much with crypto. It's not really that big of an interest to me. So I've been waiting for them to come out with a stock platform and that's what they've done. They have over a thousand stocks listed on it. If you're in the US, you can sign up for this now using one of the links in the pin comp below. As you sign up, make sure to use the refer code Carlson because they'll credit your account a $10 credit when you do your first $100 trade. And the platform is just very straightforward, very simple. This is what it looks like for me. I have Adobe and Amazon. These are my only two holdings. It's still a small account. I have $3,000 invested, but I'm in the green by $321, which is a return of almost 12%, which I think is good given the time I started this account. So, so far it's going well. I'll let you know any changes I'm making to this portfolio, but you can sign up now using one of the links in the pinned comment below. Now, the next piece of news is House of Dragon just premiered last night. It was Sunday evening, and apparently it was such a good premiere. There's so many millions of people watching it that it actually had trouble streaming specifically on the Fire TV devices. Now, I don't think this is any conspiracy theory for Amazon to try to punish their competition. They are competing with House of Dragon with their new series, Lord of the Rings, but Amazon does want people to enjoy using their devices. And I really doubt they'd harm people's viewing of a competitive service. Now, in my opinion, when a series is so popular that it crashes during the premiere, I look at that as a good thing. I don't really see this as a negative, but investors in Warner Brother Discovery don't seem to feel the same way today. It's selling off with the rest of the market. In fact, it's down 5.39%. I think this is most likely unrelated, but it's interesting to see that even during the premiere of such a key series for this streaming service, it's still down 5% the following day. Now, having said that, I haven't been very bullish on this company. I've been criticized about my view and my reaction to their last earnings. People said that it was too short-sighted and I have to give the company more time. That is true. Maybe they can improve things in the upcoming years, but as of right now, I see this company at risk of being a value trap. They have a staggering amount of debt. $51 billion of debt is a lot and will take years and years to get down to a normal level. They also have, in my opinion, a very unclear path of how to monetize their service. And in my opinion, it's more risky than most companies for being a value trap. So we'll see how Warner Brothers Discovery does in the future and I'll keep track of their future earnings report. But my guess is this new show, The House of Dragon, is going to attract a lot of incremental subscriber growth. Now moving on, we have to get to the expert advice on TikTok. This is where we really get down 
to life-changing advice that is practical and we can implement. The last TikTok advice we went over was how to have a productive day. And I thought that one was so useful, we'd do it again. This man here tells us how to be financially set in just 10 years. Buy two properties a year, every year for the next 10 years. 10 years from now, you'll have 20 properties. You'll be set free for life. The advice is really that simple. All you do is you buy two properties a year, every year for the next 10 years. And then 10 years from now, you'll have 20 properties and you're set for life. How could this get any simpler? So let's look at implementing this advice. We can assume that one property will cost us $500,000 and we can get a loan from the bank. All they require as an investor is for you to have 20% to put down, which 20% of 500,000 is around $100,000. Now to buy two of them, you'll need to save $200,000. So all you really have to do is to save $200,000 per year and invest it, and you should be set in 10 years. So it's really just that simple. Save up a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, post-tax, invest it into real estate, and in 10 years time, you'll be set. Now that's all for this episode. I'll see you in the next one.